Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, welcome Rock City. Welcome. Wow. What what a, a great world-class worship session or what? Was that just fantastic? Yeah. 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 You know, you don't just walk out on the stage and, and do that. That kind of anointing comes only by having spent many hours before the Lord in prayer and in worship together. And how about today that we give it up for all of the Rock City worship teams that are working and all of the work they're doing and the way the Lord's used them. Let's go. Come on. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to welcome today those who are worshiping with us in person at Hilliard or the Short North Campus or at Polaris, wherever you are, and welcome to all who are joining us from the over 400 prisons and institutions that are viewing in over 40 states. We are so glad that you, that you, are part of our family and you are part of our family and we want you to know that. And I want to welcome all those who are viewing on television in Columbus and Dayton and I understand in Cincinnati as well. And welcome to all who are watching online, wherever you may be, welcome home. Can you just say that to everyone who's, who's viewing today? Welcome home, thank you. Well, I found myself challenged personally each week by the messages in this summer school series. Pastor Gerald Murphy kicking off with, the, with talking about contentment. And then Dan Clark encouraging us in generosity. And Dave Stewart convicting me about love. And then Becky Medina just bared her soul about empathy. That was so powerful. And Dr. Todd Mira, who always challenges me, giving us a default setting of gratitude. And then last week, what about Tony Collier? What about Tony Collier, who came in here and shared how loyalty begins with love and grows in faith and produces repeated action? And I believe that today, God has some things that he wishes to say to us. And I need to just encourage you, I could say warn you, but I'm gonna encourage you that what God is gonna to say today is challenging. I know it's challenging because it was challenging to, to my heart, to my spirit when he said it to me. But whenever God gives us something that is, has some correction in it or some direction in it, there's always a promise of a reward. There's always a, a condition that if we will meet this condition, God will do this. And, and it's certainly in what God has to say for us today. Pastor Craig Groeschel of Life Church says we are living in an age of perpetual ascent. And when I stop and think about that, the age of perpetual ascent, I'm reminded that the word consent means to agree by an act of the will. I will consent to having ice cream with you. Almost any time, any place, anywhere, anybody who wants to, any kind of ice cream, I like ice cream, I will gladly consent to having ice cream. I, yes, I know it shows and you don't have to say anything about that. But I, I would love to have ice cream with you. Assent, on the other hand, implies that a pressure has been applied to force us to agree. Even though I didn't like it, I assented rather than to have to face the backlash. And we are living in an age of perpetual assent, an age in which we force people to agree with us, lest we cancel them out. And we're quick to cancel anybody who offends us. It used to be reserved just for, for world famous athletes or cultural heroes, but not anymore. Anyone, teacher, coach, friend, family member, make one mistake. Be accused of making one mistake. Dare to disagree with us and we will completely write you off or scratch you out of our lives. And the tragedy of this is that this practice destroys relationships. 
Family members no longer speak to each other because they don't like the way the other one voted. We completely distance ourselves from each other. We live in an age of perpetual assent. Searching, daring someone to disagree with us. If you are on a search for a way to be offended, you will always find what you are looking for. If you're always on a search for a way to be offended, you will always find what you're looking for. We are living in a culture that seeks ways to be offended. And when we look do that, when we live in a culture that looks to cancel out anyone who dis disagrees with us, that is contrary to the way that Scripture tells us where to live. Our cornerstone scripture for today, uh, our bedrock for today, is Romans chapter 12 and the 10th verse. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Would you just read that with me one time out loud together? Let's go. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Honor each other above ourselves. How are we doing with that in our culture? Well, let's pray for just a moment. Father, I just asked this morning that, that, that you speak to our hearts. Lord, that you speak to our minds. That you work in our lives. Father, that you continue to transform us into the likeness of your very purpose. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Today we're going to go to Mark chapter 6. And as we go to Mark chapter 6, let's just stop in Mark chapter 5 long enough to find out what's going on. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus is very active. He's in the, he's in the area of Galilee, just around the, the south side of the Sea of Galilee. And he has crossed over into the land of Gadarenes and he has... He has delivered the demoniac there. He comes back across the water because they don't like him because his ministry is too powerful, so they ask him to leave. Go figure that. And he comes back, and he gets word from a father that his daughter is sick, and he's on his way to this father's house. The Bible tells us the father's name is Jairus, and he's on the way to Jairus' house for minister to a little girl, and there's a woman who's had an issue of blood for 12 years. She slips up behind, and, and, and as, as Luke tells us, she, she says, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And she reaches out, and she touches the hem of garment, and, and the Bible tells us that the dunamis power of God, the same creative power, the power of the dynamite with which God creates, flowed from Jesus into that woman and healed her. And he goes on from there to J. Iris' house, and they, they come and meet him on the way, and they say, there's no need to come, she's dead. But he goes on anyway, and he gets there, and, and he says, she's only sleeping, and so they laugh at him, but he goes in, and he takes three of the disciples with him, and then he takes mom and dad in, and he raises that little girl from the dead. Coming out of that, riding on the coattail of, of that kind of, of ministry, Jesus, then we find out Mark chapter 6, Jesus left there, went to his hometown. He went to Nazareth. He was not Bethlehem. Bethlehem was where he was born. Nazareth was his hometown. Accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked, and well, what's this wisdom that's been given to him? And what are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and aren't his sisters here with us? They looked at Jesus and said, where did he get this stuff? He didn't go off to the big school down in Jerusalem. What happened here? And... and and what's this wisdom that he's espousing at us? And what right does he have to do that? Where does he get off on that? And then what are these miracles we keep hearing about? When are we going to see some of those? Hey, it, it, isn't that the carpenter's kid? Didn't he help carry lumber to frame your house? 
Didn't you change his diaper in Sabbath school? Aren't those, that's Mary's kid. Look, that's his brothers, that's his sisters here. There's nothing special about them. What's, what's so special about this guy? And then look what the Bible says. And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his own relatives, and in his own home. And he could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. Jesus went to his hometown, and in his hometown he not only was not honored, they not only withheld honor from him, they dishonored him. So what's the difference between showing honor and dishonor? Let's unpack a couple of Bible words here. And the first one is the word for dishonor. And the Greek pronunciation of it, to the best of my ability, is atimi. Atimi. And it means to treat as common or ordinary or without value. There's nothing special about it. It's every day. It's disposable. And, and actually the word that out of our vernacular today that really wraps it up is trash. It's just throwaway. You can trash it and you treat it like trash. You trashed it. The other word I want to unpack is the word for honor, and it's spelled T-I-M-E. You would think that that is time, but it is teamy. Teamy. And it means to honor, to value, to respect or, or highly esteem, to treat as significant and precious and valuable. It's like I gave you a bag of gold coins, and I threw you this bag of gold coins, and you caught it. And you wouldn't take that bag of gold coins and take it to the junk drawer that we all either have in the kitchen or the laundry room. You know the one where we put everything that we don't know what to do with and we throw it in there and then we can't remember what's there. And you know it's time to clean it out when you have to start a second drawer. <laughs> yeah, we all have that drawer someplace. And, but you don't do that with a bag of gold coins because it's valuable and you treat it as valuable and it's precious and you put it someplace where you will know where it is, someplace that's safe and someplace that you will honor. What does honor do? Honor values, it esteems, it respects, it's precious, it builds up, it cherishes, and it believes the best. What does, this, what does dishonor do? It treats as common, it tears down, it... It belittles, it criticizes, it believes the worst. It's trash. It's like, guys, when you were dating that girl and you met the girl, the one that I hope is sitting by you today. And you met that girl and the bells began to ring and the lights went off and your brain went on lock. You couldn't think about anything else but her. You couldn't, you couldn't get her out of your mind. You just wanted to be with her. You went to pick her up. You made sure your car was clean. You were always dressed the best that you had to dress when you got there. Maybe you took her flowers. Maybe you took her candy. And when you took her out, you held the car door for her. If you went someplace to eat, you held the seat. Remember those days when you were a gentleman and you did things like that? <laughs> and and you, you were always courteous to her. You held the door. And then you married her. And life comes along. Jobs and kids. and You come home from work. And she's there standing at the sink. She's worked all day and now she's trying to fix dinner, but she's got three kids hanging on her. You walk in the door. She turns around and she says, Hi, honey, how was your day? Fine. What'd you do? Nothing. You walk over and instead of giving her a hug, you, you, you scratch the dog, you pet the dog's belly. You give the dog more attention than you're giving your bride. Then you wonder a little later in the day when you try to get a little friendly with her, why she ain't too impressed with you. Just, just saying. Just saying. 
You want a God-honoring marriage? What do you do? You honor one another above yourself. You want an ordinary marriage? What do you do? Here's a recipe for an ordinary marriage. You treat as ordinary what once was special. Because if you treat as ordinary what once was special, that which was special will become ordinary every time. Did you get that? You treat as ordinary what once was special because if you treat as ordinary what once was special, what once was special will become ordinary every time. Now, Wanda and I have worked with couples who are treating as ordinary what once was special and their mates are acting out the way they're being treated. You know, it's like this. A couple feels differently about something. They disagree. Maybe they even argue about it. And then, he doesn't act honorably. Translation of that is, he's a jerk. And she can begin to think, as soon as you act honorably, I will show you honor. When you show me you deserve honor, I'll give you some honor. When you, I will respect you when you show me that you deserve my respect. The problem here is that there's a fundamental difference between honor and respect. And the difference is this. Respect, on one hand, is earned. Honor, on the other hand, is given. Honor is a posture of the heart. Honor is a humility of the soul. Honor says, God, I choose to honor you. I choose to show honor even though that other person is not showing honor to me and acting honorably because, God, this is the way, one of the ways that I honor you. And here's the crazy thing about it. When you begin to treat someone as precious, as valuable, as significant, as somebody to be treasured, when you start to ascribe honor to someone to believe the best and to build them up and to treat them as they're special, often they just start to become honorable. On the other hand, when you begin to tear someone down, to believe the worst, to criticize them, to belittle them, to trash them, it's really interesting how often they begin to become worse the very image of the way which you're treating them. So, how are we doing with this thing called honor in a culture that focuses on canceling? What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? You see, the truth of the matter is honor builds us up. Dishonor tears us down. I want to focus this morning for just a few moments on four different avenues of Scripture which we are, show, we are told that we should show honor. And we're going to move quickly on these. The first is we are to honor God. Proverbs 3.9 We're to honor God, the Almighty, the Creator, of everything. El Shaddai, the Almighty Sufficient One, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God our Healer, Jehovah Yireh, the Lord God our Provider, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord God our Banner, that God. We're to honor God. And how do we honor God? Well, there are many ways, but we're going to see three very quickly this morning. How do we honor God? We honor God with our wealth. Proverbs 3.9. We honor God by giving to him what he has already given to us. We honor him with giving him our wealth. We tithe. And the tithe is the first tenth of what we are given of what we earn. It's not the second tenth or the tenth tenth, the last thing we write. The tithe is the first fruit, the first tenth of our gross. Now, I have tithed since 1978 and given offerings above the tithe. There are two things that I have learned. 
One is that because I have looked after God's business, God has blessed mine. Because I've looked after God's business, he's blessed mine. The second thing is I've learned that I cannot outgive God. Whatever I give to God, he just pours back on me. And we're to honor God with our finances. The second way we honor God is we're to honor God with our bodies, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Our bodies are holy and set apart for his service. In the culture in which we're living, the prevailing thought and the prevailing message, especially to young women, is it's your body, so do what's best for you. Do what's right for you. It's your body. No, it's not your body. It belongs to God. Jesus paid for it with a price. He paid for you. And by the way, it's time that our young men take responsibility and realize that their bodies are not just their own either. They belong to God. And just a thought, guys, seems like I'm on guys today. Might be because I am one and understand this so badly. That girl is not a fox. That girl is God's daughter. And you need to treat her as such. So because our bodies are holy and set aside for his service, there are some places that we don't go and some things that we won't do because we honor God with our bodies. The third way in which we honor God is we honor God with our worship. Our worship isn't lip service. Our worship is the overflow of our hearts because of who God is and what he has done. And we live in a culture which makes fun of God or he completely denies his existence. If they do acknowledge him, they laugh at the thought of him. They portray him as a dawdling little old man who's confused and doesn't know anything. They refer to him as the big G, the man upstairs, or the big guy. He's none of those. He is God, the creator of everything. He is God who controls all of the universes. And we honor him with our worship. The second group we're to honor. We're to honor our parents. And if your age is 13 to 19, you're probably looking at me right now and saying, but my parents are weird. <laughs> I have a newsflash for you. Yes, they are. <laughs> your parents are weird. My parents were weird. I couldn't wait to get out from underneath their authority so that I could live however I wanted to live. My son felt the same way. What you're feeling isn't new. It's normal. It will work out. I can virtually promise you that your parents will get better. Possibly even to the place where you might actually enjoy them. I know that's a stretch, but it can happen. <laughs> Parents, please allow me to give you a quick tip. From someone who's not only raised a child, but I've poured into most of a thousand young men during 43 seasons of coaching basketball. Parents are not called, nor are we instructed, to be our kids' buddies or their BFF. We're instructed to be the spiritual authority in their lives. And one of the best ways we can teach our children to honor within the home is by teaching them to speak with respect. Answer, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Now, I know that's really old school, and some of you are thinking, that ain't happening in our house. Okay. What about, yes, dad. Yes, mom. And the same when addressing adults. The point is this. This is the reason. How are they going to learn to honor another? How are they going to learn to honor a mate unless they have been taught how to honor within the nuclear family? 
And besides, I have never known anyone who failed a job interview because their manners were too good. It's never happened. Well, I'm going to move on now so that I can offend anybody I haven't offended already. <laughs> you know, living a life of honor is contrary to our prevailing culture, and it's, it's grates on us when we talk about these things. So get ready. We've done the light stuff. We're to honor those who are in authority. Romans 13, 1 through 7. Now, some of us thought during the past presidential administration, there's no way I'm going to honor that man. There's no way I'm going to honor that administration. And there are just as many who are thinking during this administration, I'm not about to honor this administration. He may be president, but he ain't my president. I have lived under 14 presidents. I've been to the White House to sing for one. I was invited to Washington for a meeting with another. I even did a duet with a man who later became president. I have liked some of our leaders, and some of them not so much. And I have, I have disagreed in both tone and policy with them. But without regard to our feelings, we are to honor our leaders. Those we voted for and those we did not vote for. We honor them by the way that we talk about them. We don't have to agree with them. It's fine to disagree with them. But we do speak re respectfully about them. We honor them by praying for them. It's the right thing to do. You don't have to agree with them. But God requires us to honor them. In the Old Testament, David was running for his life from King Saul, and King Saul was trying to kill him. Now, David refused to harm Saul when he had the opportunity to kill him. He had him right in his clutches and could have killed him, but he refused to lay a hand on him. Now, I'm not aware that the president has tried to kill me. And we can disagree without dishonoring. And come on, church, we're better than that. We're better than that. The fourth area is Scripture teaches us to honor pastors and church leaders. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Understand, I'm just a guy who's just glad to have the opportunity to serve on the team here. I simply volunteered to clean the toilets or sweep floors or do anything else that might help. But Scripture says that those who lead the church are worthy of double honor. It includes pastors and staff and those who serve in children's ministry and youth workers. Look, if you serve in children's ministry or you're a youth, youth worker, you deserve triple honor. <laughs> we can't give you enough honor. So... How about giving it up for all those who, who lead in serving our families? Now, how about we take it to the next level? How about we come with thank you cards, gift cards? You know, ministry workers like Starbucks. <laughs> Expressions of appreciation and honor. And how many will begin to say thank you for serving Thank you for caring, even when you pick your kids up today. Honor matters to God. It matters to you. It matters to me. Why does honor matter? Why is it so important? Because honor will place you in the right posture before God. Honor puts you in the right posture before God because dishonor actually hurts you. Anytime you're dishonoring, it hurts you. Go back quickly to Mark chapter 6 as we get ready to wrap up here. Show you something we missed. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. Verse 5. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. It does not say 
that he would not. It says he could not. He wasn't lacking in ability. He had just, he had just delivered a demoniac, healed a woman of an issue of blood that she'd had for 12 years and raised a little girl from the dead. That's a pretty good ministry resume. Yet, in this environment where there was no faith and where dishonor was rampant, he could do no miracles except heal a few sick people. He was restrained. He was held back from it. Now, I'm not going to attempt to dissect that, but I think we can all get the gist of it. A lack of honor and a lack of faith limited Jesus, what, what Jesus could have done otherwise. So I wonder... What miracles and what blessings has God wanted to do for you? For me? For us? That he could not do because we were not honoring. What prayers has God wanted to answer for you? But he didn't because you lacked honor. Our bedrock scripture today, Romans 12.10 says, Honor one another above yourselves. How are we doing in this culture of cancel when we write off friends over a Facebook post? Honor one another above yourselves. The ESV says, outdo one another in showing honor. So you want a marriage to be blessed? What if we tried to out-encourage each other? What if we tried to show extreme kindness? What if we worked to outdo our spouse in showing honor? What if we tried to outgive one another? What if we tried to outshare one another? What if we took our children and we tried to out-encourage one another and we lived in truly a developed culture of radical generosity? I want to take just a moment to honor a few people in my life. First, my mom and dad, Dr. Garland and Evelyn Campbell, both been gone many years. But they loved me. When I was an addict, my dad came and searched for me when nobody could find me. They prayed for me. They encouraged me, always in all good things, and they never stopped believing in God's plan for my life. Never. I pray my life honors. I want to honor my beautiful and wonderful bride of 40 years, Wanda. <laughs> the love of my life, the mother of our son, grandmother of our grandchildren, my partner, a rock who has always steadied me. Thank you. I want to honor the leadership of this magnificent church, beginning with Pastor Chad and Katie Fisher. The lead team, the magnificent staff, they labor tirelessly to make heaven full. They establish a culture of excellence and radical generosity than a can rather than a cancel culture. Would you give it up for them, please? The first and most important step to honoring God is to honor the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, who gave his life that you might be saved. The price has been paid for your salvation. And you may respect God regardless of what you believe, but you cannot honor God without accepting his son, Jesus, as your savior and the Lord of your life. Impossible to honor him without that. Scripture that author John Brevere calls the rule of honor, God says, I will honor those who honor me. I will despise those who think lightly of me. Now, I can't speak for you, but personally, I have no desire to be on the despised by God list. But God says, I will honor those who honor me. See, when God gives us direction, when God gives us a challenge, when he gives us correction, there's always this promise of result. He says, I will honor those who honor me. 
You honor God, God will honor you. And I promise you, God will out honor you. He will honor you. Beginning with eternal life and everything else is just a fringe benefit. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never accepted God's gift for you, if you've never honored God with that, this is your moment. This is your day. I'm going to ask you to join me in honoring God today with this simple prayer and to then begin to walk in the footsteps of his word. I'm going to ask that every person in this room, regardless of how long you may have served Jesus, pray this prayer out loud together with me, please. Father God, I want to thank you for what you did for me through the cross of Jesus. I want to honor you with my life. Thank you for, give, for forgiving my sins. And I confess today that Jesus is Lord of my life. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Please lead and guide me in my journey of following after Christ. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen.